Hello guys and uh, welcome to this second episode of our uh, summer series. So we made it to episode 2, mostly thanks to the uh, very positive reaction from all of you uh, following the first uh, edition and really good, uh, good feedback and uh, lots of views on the YouTube, mostly broke. Uh, my young channel's records for viewing so that's good good job so we are I was motivated to right away to do, do another one and this this time we will remain uh, in the 2012 uh, 2013 season and revisit the uh, season itself so this was the inaugural uh, season for the league as uh, you all know and that's part of the fun why uh, we're coming back to to see what's happened and how it unfolded in year one. So before before we we go into stats and uh, standings and everything, uh, let's take a look at some more history, uh, not draft related on things that we didn't mention last time. So uh, the you see the salary cap number. Uh, the the interesting quirk here is that uh, the UDL salary it, it is not going down. It's stipulated in the rules, and uh, it did happen for a couple of seasons. Uh, this cap was determined before the uh, 2012 walkout, NHL walkout, and after the walkout, uh, the NHL cap actually decreased but we stayed at the 70.2 level until the NHL caught up in a couple of seasons and then we started climbing along with the NHL one. So this is here the, the more interesting part. Another important thing were the salaries uh, because it, it was an offline draft and uh, it was not an auction. Uh, the salaries were determined by the, the draft position. So. This here was the curve. So on the bottom, on the bottom axis, there are, is the draft position, and on the uh, the y axis or the y axis is the the salary. So you see quite a steep. Let me put on the highlighter. Uh, the quite a steep decrease in the first four rounds, and then more gradual one until we reach the later rounds where the league minimum at, at the time was uh, 0 0.5 to 5 uh, million so the last few rounds were very close to the league minimum also we couldn't uh, sign all of our picks to uh, max the max term deals so this means four year deals we had uh, restrictions like the, the here so you could retain no more than five players uh, to four year deals and so on and so on of course if you if any of us wanted could sign all of his veterans to only one year deals there was no restriction on that and we get here to a point about the regular season the regular season of course was cut short by the shorter NHL season as a whole so we had to squeeze some regular season games and the playoffs within uh, the very packed uh, NHL schedule. So this this meant we we had only ten week long uh, regular season, and this is important. But uh, what will turn out more important is the next point that uh, the these ten matchups were split in eight divisional and only two out of division matchups so you had you played all of your division rivals twice and two other teams once uh, also back uh, another important thing back in the beginning in the early days of the league we had a 50 dollar entry fee most of you remember and this was uh, the distributed to the top three regular season teams and the playoff champ so Basically, the the um, the winning spot was uh, a lot more top heavy. 
and uh, with this with armed with this information we can uh, we can move on to the hey wait wait what what bad tiger bad tiger no oh, pretend pretend that didn't happen uh, those tigers are pesky aren't they so come on let's move on we see what happens later but uh, anyway let's move on first thing I want to show you is something that is mm, you can you can't see it in the uh, in the regular season standings not in the roto standings this is a simulation of the 2012-13 season mm, as if nobody changed no uh, nobody changed their teams after the veteran draft so we picked all of the teams pick 23 players and then we move on without trades without claims and we simulate the whole season in roto style so this would have been the standings and right away i want to point out the most impressive thing for me and it was really really fascinating i didn't expect that this is the five patrick teams these are the five patrick teams in the top six in this particular simulated standings which is really i don't know it's mind-blowing for me so and a, a little more surprising even is that uh, the ramparts are not uh, in the top but they are very close yet still but the vipers and the blazers had one heck of a draft especially according to this uh, this uh, <coughs> version of of the future that never happened uh, but uh, mm, they they drafted very solid and the vipers only had a few uh, shortcomings and this was because they drafted very few defensemen so you could you could expect that they would be a bit short in the uh, points by defenseman and block shots. Uh, the Blazers drafted very solidly, and uh, also the the Aces and the Wanderers were very high in this uh, in this ranking. Uh, don't be fooled by the Tigers of though, because they had excellent out uh, outlook after the draft for their skaters and really abysmal abysmal goaltending stats. Uh, or goat ending uh, stats that would have come from their draft picks. So basically, they they drafted uh, Kiprusov and uh, Harding. One was in the twilight of his career, and the other one battled uh, serious illness. And this here on the right is uh, what uh, happened at the end of the season. So uh, some comparison between this simulation and the actual standings uh, and you see in the last uh, the last column is in the red are the fall the followers and in green are the climbers so basically uh, the teams in green managed to improve on their initial position after the draft and uh, the ones in in red uh, lost ground from the from their starting position. And these two columns here, the steal with team and the games played percentage. So these show that, uh, for example, Greg and the uh, Kamloops team, they stuck with their draft picks as did uh, some other teams. Of course, you're, you will not be surprised that Odessa is also in high here in this percentage. Max, the emblem of loyalty and uh, some other teams like the ghost not surprisingly for this season and as a whole and the warriors uh traded more more than half of their teams before the end of the season traded or dropped or, or bought out it doesn't matter but the, the, the their, their draft picks were not at their team at the end and the game played percentage is again only from their original veteran draft picks 
but this means that they, the 23 players played 94% of the total possible games during the season. So this means a very healthy lineup. And when we go into the more red ones, this means that either a lot of injuries occurred to the, this particular group of players or some of them were not uh, NHL regular players. So this, these two reasons are grouped here into one column, the, the injuries and the NHL, the, the regular play, play time. So this I found really quite impressive, especially the strength of the Patrick coming out of the draft. It was, I don't know if we had, so we will basically see just in a couple of minutes how this affected their own division mostly and the standings as a, as a whole. So now we, this is the final standing standings of the regular season. So again, the teams, divisions, of course, uh, points, winning percentage. And uh, the line uh, where the playoff uh, teams were above the line are playoff teams and below are teams out of the playoffs. So, so a couple of interesting things. First, uh, the, the top four teams were actually the division winners, which doesn't happen uh, every season. I would say it, even it happens not that often. Uh, but uh, as you can see, the Patrick did not dominate uh, in the points standings. It was mostly because of the, the schedule. Because we had so intra-division heavy schedule, the Patrick division basically cannibalized itself. Uh, it was just too strong and someone had to lose in this 80% of matchups which are in the division. And when your division is ultra strong, you're bound to have a losing team, no, no matter uh, how strong uh, the overall the overall strength of the division is. So uh, mm, really uh, looking at the, the Roto ranks, again, the Patrick was still the strongest, Adams was second, and uh, the Norris and the Smite were pretty far uh, off the pace. And, uh, but what you can see here is that four, four Norris teams uh, made the playoffs and it is because they benefited from having uh, a very weak team in the division and this is of course the ghost of course for I'm, say, I'm saying of course because all of us that were playing in that season remember the how bad the ghosts were were they historically bad you might ask and the answer is you bet you can see if the other five seasons of the league the the teams that finished bottom of the league each had a close to double winning percentage compared to the goals from that season. So really they were very bad, maybe compared to some of the NHL uh, teams from the past in the expansion eras where they ca came in and played 70 games and won like nine or something pretty spectacular spectacularly bad <laughs> so I'm no, I don't want to pile on Jay, uh, Jay he actually managed to to have a 50% uh, or better winning percentage in all of uh, the coming seasons so he's now I think very close to 500 in a lifetime of his team so he managed quite well after that uh, and one more thing here, I put it in yellow, the Brooklyn Aces were fourth in the Roto standings at the end of the season. Not the simulated ones, the actual ones. And they finished 16 in the actual standings. So it, they had a quite 
bad luck. So we ask another question, were they historically unlucky? And of course the answer again is yes. The next two teams in this in this rankings are the the Ghosts from 1415 and the Lin Chopin from 1516. Both of these teams also missed the playoffs, but the difference between their roto position and their uh, end of uh, regular season standings position was not as uh, big. So this is how we finished the regular season. So these teams made the playoffs, but before we go to the playoffs and etc., uh, we we'll take a look at uh, the teams but we'll f keep the focus on the division so we take a look at each team but uh, in uh, uh, division by division breakdown so we start with the Patrick we've talked a lot of already a lot about the strength of the Patrick so we naturally start with them uh, you see here first uh, the, the Detroit Vipers they were in the, our simulated table after the draft they were the top team and they remained the top team in the Patrick uh, after the season but but because of the strength of the division they failed to to fourth overall which still uh, still secured them a buy in the first round of the playoffs but uh, didn't uh, didn't give them very favorable matchups uh, going forward in the playoffs. So the to to say a few words about the Detroit team and how how they did and how the season unfolded. As you saw earlier, uh, the the only shortcoming the team had was uh, on D because they had too few defensemen drafted. So they got uh, in the first days of the season they got uh, Sergei Gonchar in a trade and he was pretty solid still in 2013 uh, and already the dread, uh, close to the deadline to the trade deadline they made a big trade with the San Diego Girls which included like six pieces but um, unfortunately for the Vipers they tried to improve by acquiring uh, Joe Pavelski and uh, Havat from from the Ghost, but the, they actually gave up uh, Pascal Dupuy in the trade, which uh, ironically Dupuy had a better season than Pavelski in that year, and it was surprising that really ac across the board of the UDL categories Dupuy was uh, better than Pavelski but this was during the heyday of Chris Kunitz and Dupuy as uh, wingers for Sidney Crosby so you can maybe not expect that but you will not be that shocked next uh, the Ramparts they finished second fifth uh, in the overall standings uh, so they easily made, made the playoffs and were the highest seed in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, the ramparts were mixed back. Ah, sorry, I missed. Uh, I intended to tell you before I started uh, saying this. You see here, I'm not reading all because too much information. But you see here the top five picks from the veteran draft for each team. Uh, another five players that uh, were picked later but did uh, did good uh, the, the goalies but not the goalies from the draft these are the goalies that they finished the season with so it's a bit of a mixed bag and the uh, players highlighted in light green or light blue I don't know how how you see it on your screen but the highlighted players mean that uh, these players finished in the top 20 uh, in their respective position at the end of the season. The top 20 determined by the UDL categories and uh, basically ranked by me based on spreadsheets and everything so it's not some official ranking but I think 
it should do the job. Uh, only for the defenseman is not the top 20, it's the top 30 because the defenseman position is a bit more populated. So that's that's the cover coding here for you to uh, to read or to to take a look how each team did. Mm. So coming back to to the ramparts, they were not a powerhouse or not the powerhouse we know from years past, but uh, they were pretty solid. You see here here. here he were here <laughs> not highlighted but that's because save managed to get here and draft uh, fast so he had both uh, Anaheim goalies for the season and Corey Schneider so they had a very good goal, goal tender crew which really uh, provided solid contributions in the goal tending stats and uh, Mm, they made a, a couple of good trades for the future in like picking up Tyler to Foley mid-season and also uh, acquiring Chris Stewart and then trading it, uh, trading him away uh, in acquiring a first rounder in the process so quite an interesting season for the Ramparts as they were strong but not necessarily all in for year one so, turned out to be a pretty successful strategy in retrospect third place in the division were belonged to the Blazers which were one of the strongest teams after the draft and you see they, they really drafted well because they didn't make uh, basically any trades or in very few FA pickups but they drafted very solidly in the top five and below and later I should say. Uh, Pominville was maybe the only reach they had in the fourth round but otherwise pretty good. Antti Niemi here was one of the top three goalies in the in the season so he he was their main contributor in goal but uh, with uh, only Neuwirt to, to, to back him up uh, the goaltending category is where the Blazers fell a bit short. Uh, next team in the division was the Montreal Montreal Wanderers, uh, Team Steen, and uh, King Henrik was himself at that time yet, maybe the top, really the top goal, goalie uh, in the league, and well worth the first rounder, but then it got a bit spotty with Hartnell and Patrick Sharp and Hartnell um, basically had a pretty pretty bad season and uh, definitely it seems that compared to the Aces who were m maybe the stronger team the Montreal managed to come out on top in the division although because of that dog fight, uh, they both, I mean, the Wanderers and the Aces both missed the playoffs. Uh, and talking about the Aces, they got a very strong one two punch in the draft in Crosby and uh, Evander Kane. Uh, Cam Ward, he got injured uh, during that season, so he really couldn't contribute and, and couldn't justify the third round uh, the third round pick and uh, you see here Jeff Skinner Brent Burns solid picks but they both had a bit of down years so they were good picks for the future but couldn't really push the aces over the over the top for this particular season and interestingly uh, this was David Clarkson's last good season after which he signed that huge deal with Toronto and huge awful deal with Toronto that he's actually still on in the NHL so the Aces managed to get the benefits of Clarkson's last good season so the next division we take a look at 
is the atoms which was the second strongest and here we we reach or we face the tigers first the tigers who were the top team in the regular season uh, finished first in their division of course and were really very strong especially especially on the, the skater side but what we I'm sorry what was more impressive was that Cam moved very quickly to fix his problem in goal on the literally in the first week of the season he picked up Ray Emery as a free agent which you see here that he was his second best uh, his second goalie at the end of the season he then made a trade or uh, around that time he made a trade to trade away Chris Letang and bring in Ben Scrivens and of course Philip Forsberg which we talked about in the previous video but he took a goalie who was on the uh, on a farm contract so he could provide spot starts so really excellent management by the Tigers to quickly identify the weak spot of their team and fix it and then they had the quality already there as a skaters to really power through power through the, the season <coughs> of course for all the teams we talk about uh, from the, the next three divisions I will not I will not say it uh, all the time but you for all of them is valid that uh, they were rookie in that season they were not in the Patrick division so all of the f rest 15 teams were uh, at least a bit lucky that they they had an, another division as their own so anyway with uh, that said yeah, pretty good picks. Marty St. Louis was f on fire that that uh, that year. He scored. Uh, it was a shortened season, but uh, he scored uh, at a more than 100 point pace on pro prorated to an 82 game season. So it was really one of the last great seasons that uh, he had. And the Tigers were a uh, really a very strong team from the start uh, next in the uh, Adams were the Macon Whoopi team uh, team that is that has been re re relocated since but this was one of the better seasons they had finished second in the division ninth in the in the regular season standings and you see strong very strong picks in the first five and um, another another two very strong picks especially Voracek who had uh, uh, 46 points in the 48 games played that season and I something else I wanted to mention here Patrick Kane in the fourth round what were we thinking so and if you look at the, this division in particular, look at the fourth round picks. What is this? It looks like more than the second round to me. But anyway, obviously we had we had some home runs to hit in the third round, but uh, it seems that the fourth round was really very good value, especially in the Adams. It was not everywhere but the Adams they struck gold in the fourth round basically throughout um, so you see here the the whoopee they had the Rene who was solid and uh, but uh, the second goalie of their crew was really a good goalie but basically a backup so uh, you wonder what uh, you wonder what could have uh, happened if uh, the Whoopi managed to get some get a second starting goalie to work with with Rene towards the end of the season. Maybe that would have pushed them 
um, further in the playoffs. Anyway, we move, we move on to Upper Canada Patriots and Mark Hillier's team. So you see again, no flops in the top five. Um, from the other five or the the rest of the top ten contributors on the team, uh, some good ones, but nothing spectacular. Uh, Fleury was the man in goal, the main man, and uh, Steve Mason was the second fiddle. Uh, but uh, a good team, but nothing really impressive. Uh, interesting that uh, uh, the the Patriots didn't make very many trades during the season one although we know that uh, later on Mark was one of the more trigger happy owners when it comes to trades but uh, the season one was one that uh, many of us were more conservative or more hesitant to, to make big deals yet so anyway uh, the Patriots still made the playoffs but were not really a force then we move on to to the scouts Kansas City scouts uh, they drafted some solid players but really not not high end and if you look at all the the draft picks some good ones but mm, not not flashy and uh, they really Daniel Sidin had only 12 goals and uh, overall the team had too few goals and with goals really a very important category since basically it, it is related with the shots and the special team goals and uh, if you don't have goals you basically lose mostly three categories right there so it was tough sledding for the scouts and speaking of, of tough sledding um, the jack of Ops in the first season they didn't really do great uh, there's some excellent picks here especially Bergeron and Holby Holby in the fifth round was a steal and then you see below you have Victor Hedman and Justin Falk so pretty solid foundation but with their first round pick in Kovalchuk he was injured for one third of the season so he, he really didn't uh, didn't manage to contribute as much as you would expect from a first rounder he only only <coughs> had 11 goals in the season uh, Kessel was uh, hot uh, and it was well worth the third round pick but um, he Max did pretty good and I want to mention one more thing uh, Bishop was picked in the final round of the veteran draft so he got Holdby and Bishop which will turn out to be an excellent tandem as soon as next year because Bishop started the year uh, as a backup in Ottawa and then got traded to Tampa Bay where, where he became the number one guy so as soon as next season you will see the fortunes of the J. Lopes really impressively turn around for the better so we move on to the next division which is the Norris which was the third strongest overall looking at uh, the Roto standings mostly I keep mentioning the Roto standings because and referencing to Roto standings because they are the more neutral uh, evaluator or neutral um, how to say quantifier but uh, that's definitely not to say that mm, I like them better or something I, I would say I hate Roto uh, it's, it's very boring and uh, 
what we have here is the head to head uh, is way more exciting for me and uh, really the more interesting and everything better anyway that was off topic so we go to the Norris and we start with the Lin Chopin's so Brad as we saw in the table at the beginning he started around mid table after the after the draft but then he he moved quickly to to cover some some shortcomings and he actually finished uh, first in the division third in the regular season but the top team in the roto standings at the end of the season so you see very good uh, some very good picks especially Wayne Simmons who is a beast in the our league uh, Rask was a top notch goaltender Eberle was maybe a bit of a reach but he still performed quite well so it was definitely not a not a total flop uh, but uh, you see other picks here Matt Martin and Rinaldo of players of quite some value in our league with the penalty minutes and hits categories and uh, what you don't see here are many defensemen so that's why Brad moved made a move on day one or around day one to acquire Chris Letang then he also got uh, Eric Johnson and later flipped uh, Letang in another trade and got uh, John Carlson and Martin Hanzo plus a first rounder so and John Carlson was on the upswing so a good move for the future for the present and the future and Hanzo when he was healthy has always been very strong in the UDL so hits face of percentage some scoring excellent player <laughs> so it was sorry it was a team that was very strong especially in the physical department in the hits and penalty minutes uh, the Lin Chopin team pretty much dominated uh, second place in the division went to the ice dice uh, which were the the highest ranked Norris team in our initial simulation they had a they had a solid draft uh, interestingly you see Tyler Sagan is the only one from their top five that didn't crack the top 20 in his position but uh, that's because that's why that's because he missed uh, some games but uh, and didn't have the best season but it was nonetheless a definitely a good pick in the third round because you we know how well he he played later uh, Corey Crawford was uh, one of the steals of the draft is maybe okay relative steals because he was an eight rounder but for a starting goalie that was uh, quite a steal uh, the Ice Dice had a very strong decor and they re relied heavily on the, uh, the these uh, defensive categories so they have Schattenkirk here and Franson, Jack Johnson and Boschemann as uh, top, uh, top players but uh, mm, uh, yeah I wanted to to notice something else that yeah that uh, Dan Ellis here listed as a second uh, he was part of the goalie carousel that uh, uh, played for the ice dice in this second goalie starting place as their uh, second goaltender picked in the veteran draft was Jose Theodore and he was dropped around mid-season so he re they really had a one good goalie and then it was a mixed bag and not really that good next the Wolfsburg Grizzly Adams mm. James managed to finish seventh in the regular season which was pretty close to the ice dice uh, 14th in Roto but still like we said at the beginning these teams all benefited from having to having to play the San Diego Ghost twice 
so they they had a good boost boost in their percentage and points totals so the draft of the grizzly adams was pretty good bobby ryan was maybe a bit of a reach but to compensate for that they had blake weaver in the seventh round which was an excellent pick both then and for the future but the the whole team was pretty much carry price dependent which is ironic because uh, it makes them similar to the current Montreal Canadiens in the NHL but basically price didn't have a great year that season so they didn't uh, he he couldn't push the Grizzly Adams further up on himself by himself um yeah they had only the Wolfsburg team only had one big trade during the season and it was the Vasilevsky one which was already discussed both in the last video and after that so I'm not gonna talk about it specifically so we're going on to the Warriors and uh, Roy's team so we get here to the two teams that were the most active ones on the trade market in year one you know, they they flipped uh, or changed moved more than half of their teams even two-thirds of their teams and the sparta team was hard to evaluate from the start because if you look on paper especially from the position of now uh, eric carlson was a no-brainer first rounder but in that year he he was injured and uh, he played only 17 games so he basically ruined pretty much the uh, the Warriors chances to be really competitive in that season Nugent Hopkins was definitely a reach at uh, in the second round because in our league he doesn't doesn't really score enough goals and basically loses uh, loses the face of percentage category by himself for your team most of the weeks so quite an unimpressive pick there but after that some solid veterans but eh, you see here on the top 10 even Ray Whitney pops up remember Ray Whitney ha, that's a fun I was when I was doing the video I was surprised that Ray Whitney was still playing when we were already playing but yeah he was and he was quite good the wizard so the the Warriors definitely had a good goaltending tandem they were especially strong in the wins category so they they must have killed it I don't think any other team had a, as much wins as uh, the Warriors but they were pretty average in the other categories so I think they didn't dominate the goaltending stats and uh, we come here to we come now to the to the goals we're not going to pile uh, to pile it on the goals uh, they had some decent picks but Spezza played only five games so he was injured most of the season uh, mm, many of the, their players also like uh, Milan Mihalik, uh, David Booth, Eric Johnson were also miss, missed time with injuries but uh, yeah like we said this was definitely a lost season for the Ghosts but they managed to turn it around quickly after that and they they they, they didn't stand pat Jay of course uh, as active as ever but maybe the, then more than ever he made a number of big trades in which he moved out all of his or not all of his but the three of his top picks that were uh, doing well that season Perry, Vucic and Pavelski were all moved out Spezza was bought out which was the highest 
uh, salary and the highest uh, draft uh, position buyout in year one and uh, also Seabrook, Eric Johnson and Brian Elliott, uh, the goaltender, were moved out and in came uh, Matt Dumba, Zetterberg, Ryan Getzaf, Pascal Dupuy, Derek Brassard, a first rounder and a second rounder. So from all the trades Jay made that season, he only managed to get an additional one first rounder and one second rounder. So compared to to that, what uh, what Jay managed to do in this year's draft and have six first rounders is quite quite impressive, I think. Looking into perspective, or maybe in the first year we were very stingy in giving up first rounders. That might have been true too. <coughs> And then the last division is the Smythe, uh, which was relatively the weakest. Oh, the Steelers uh, managed to win this, although mm, they didn't look like uh, the powerhouse team. Mm, they were 16 Roto at the end of the season, so really they managed to get the benefit of the the matchups uh, but uh, the 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 Steelers I can tell you I have inside knowledge uh, they were a team that were built around the defensive categories so not around goals and uh, scoring but around uh, hits and block shots uh, defense one points face of percentage and penalty minutes so uh, Ryan Callahan in that season was every bit as good as his drafting position. He was dominant in the hits department, scored a lot of goals, many of them in the special team variety. Really excellent. Anders Lindback was a total reach in the third round and then spectacular uh, bust. He was the second most highest bolt out player after Spezza. Then, but then pretty solid veterans in Koivu, Boyo, Parento, Timunen. Duncan Keith was uh, also on that team, as was uh, Marek Zidlicki, who was acquired in the trade uh, mid-season. <coughs> so with some good claims, especially here you, s you notice the second goal tender is Joey McDonald. A bit of an afterthought. Most of us probably don't remember he even played uh, some games in the NHL, but he <coughs> he managed to play some games for Detroit and then for Calgary when my uh, when uh, the starting goalie was injured. And basically, McDonald stole some playoff games for the Steelers in that season. So. I will be forever grateful to that guy. Although I completely forgot that before I made this video. So anyway, <laughs> uh, on to the Turtles, who were actually the impressive team in the division, especially in the top end talent. You see, they had both Ovechkin and Bufflin in the first uh, in the veteran draft, which were the, like for me the after doing many analysis and many spreadsheets on our league data Ovechkin and Bufflin were are the premier uh, players or at least one of the top five players overall in our format and for uh, for Elliot to be able to draft them both was quite quite a coup uh, in that draft Halak in between Unfortunately for him, it didn't work out, especially in year one. Uh, Halak, he was uh, mostly injured, uh, but uh, mm, uh, to make up for that, you, we have here Bobrovsky, and he was a 19 round pick. And you see his stat line for the season, 
he was a top five goalie in the league so excellent pickup and actually that saved the season for the turtles because otherwise he would have no goal t- no goal tending left you look at steve Ott here and you might think it's a bit of a reach in the fourth round but it's not Steve Ott was an excellent player in this league during his best years. <coughs> As he dominated uh, not only the hits, some penalty minutes, very good face of percentage, but could score you 10 to 15 goals in a season. So it was really pretty good and uh, rare across the board coverage. So move on to the the Flames. The Flames, they had a top pick in the draft, in the veteran draft. They used it for Malkin, which is flashy. And Malkin is one of the best players ever. But he is often injured and this was the case in the in that season. He missed uh, uh he missed like one third of the season. And uh, that and also Mike Smith and Franzen they didn't contribute as uh, as much as their uh, top top five pick status suggested. So the the, the Flames were pretty uh, pretty weak team. They got some bounces, I guess, because they finished third in the division, although they were 19th in, in Roto, but they were not lucky enough to make it or to squeak into the playoffs as they finish in the 13th position uh interesting is that they make a couple of swaps uh in the goaltending department they got nabokov who had an excellent season but they traded it they got him in the 12th round which was excellent but they traded it traded him for craig anderson but then later when they were already out of contention they traded Anderson uh, to the Tigers uh, for a second rounder so there were quite a few goalies on the move in trades it seems Um, so we further uh, in the teams of the smite that didn't make the playoffs next the mighty camels they had a excellent player in Stamkos at number two but after that uh, Landis Koch he had a down year otherwise an excellent player in our league but he didn't uh, he didn't have it in year one so that was not good for the for the camels Ryan Muir was still good at the time maybe not great they managed to get uh, Brian Elliott in a trade uh, with um, with the ghost one of the big trades with the ghost but uh, the mighty camels act, mm, they didn't look like challenging for the playoffs uh, from the deadline on so it was mostly a boost for the mighty camel supporters to stay involved <laughs> i guess uh, and anyway to the royals uh, the chiliwak royals uh, they finished last in the division and were one of the the weaker teams as we saw oh also from the after right after the draft simulation they had some some decent picks but uh, really a lack of uh, top end talent uh parise was already mm, not at his in his best days like he was in New Jersey um, they didn't have a lot of scoring but they didn't have a lot of physical um, contributions to so they were basically lacking everywhere and had some serious injury injury issues as uh, all of uh, guests were Patrick Hornquist, Geoffrey Lupu and Stephen Weiss missed uh, missed times missed m- around half the season or more than half the season with with uh, injuries so 
and I have two fun facts here regarding the Royals. First, uh, first fun fact is that they managed to employ Cody Hodgson for his uh, best season in the NHL, where he scored uh, uh, at a 60-point pace, pro-rated pro pace for a 82-game season. And the second fun fact is that they employed Alexei Kovalev for his brief uh, stint in the with the Florida Panthers in this season. So he played the 14 games or something like this in the NHL and the Royals were on, on hand to be be the last uh, the last uh, UDL employer of the great Alexei Kovalev. And that's the fun facts for the Royals. So with that completed, we move on to the to the playoffs and we go round by round. I'm not going to go into very much details, but this was the round one. So the the ramparts were cre clearly um, the stronger team against the the Warriors, the Warriors which basically squeaked into the playoffs based on the some wins some big wins against the Ghosts so easy win for the Ramparts uh, then the Blazers showed that uh, showed the strength of the, the Patrick in uh, winning against a higher seeded uh, uh, Ice Dice team the Grizzly Adams de destroyed the Upper Canada Patriots which was not really Basically, the Upper Canada Patriots had an off week for some reason. It's not that these teams were so far apart in the standings or in the quality of their teams, but so it happens in the playoffs. And in the really top matchup in the first round, the Macon, Macon Whoopi team managed to uh, squeak a win over the Turtles. And uh, overall strong team of the Whoopi managed to overcome a seven seven goal week by Alex Ovechkin for the Turtles. Seven goals but I guess not enough support from the rest of the Turtles team. And uh, in the next round here come the big guns and the big guns play like one. Play like some. I don't know how it's correct. But uh, this is actually the only time in round two where the division winners all managed to win and move on, which is quite impressive and surprising. Maybe not surprising, but it's an interesting fact. So the Tigers uh, managed to to avoid upset against the Blazers, which uh, who. Mm. <coughs> one of the the teams from the very strong Patrick division uh, the Steelers overcome the, the the strong Whoopi team uh, basically riding their strategy on uh, relying on blocks the, the points and uh, the physical stats then the Lin Shopping team dispatch of the Grizzly Adams in what what is one of the classic Norris matchups which we see and uh, we're gonna see in the next years it's a pretty good one and then we have another uh, divisional matchup in the top teams uh, of the Patrick division facing against one another and maybe the the most <coughs> the most quality matchup of the round but the the vipers managed to stay in control in most most categories and win at the end and in the semi-finals uh, again the one versus four and two versus three and again no surprises the top top seeded teams managed to pull out and uh, both win with a 10 to 4 scoreline 
and uh, the Hamilton versus the Vipers uh, for me after reviewing this was maybe the strongest matchups in the whole playoffs in that year really uh, very strong s offensive performance and good goal tending but uh, the Tigers firm control over the grid category so the hits and block shots and penalty minutes ensure that they came out on top and uh, the Steelers uh, interestingly enough uh, the <coughs> the Linshu Pin team played a very impressive game as far as scoring goes but here is when uh, uh, Joey McDonald stole the, the game uh, for the Steelers as uh, the Steelers managed to to get most of the goaltending categories and on to the final and the Tigers the Tigers win it in what is so far the only championship game between the number one and the number two seed. Uh, interesting to note here is that because of the condensed schedule the final was only a one week long affair and basically the Tigers beat the Steelers at their own game. So the Tigers won uh, most of the defensive and uh, physical categories and although the Steelers managed to score at a decent pace and have some good offensive numbers they came short and uh, the title in the first in the inaugural season went to the Hamilton Tigers and as you see in the spoiler and you, as you saw in the spoiler at the beginning the Tigers managed to uh, come away with the titles in both the regular season and the playoffs which was an excellent first season for them and with that we conclude the formal part of the video so on to the more free program uh, we talked about a bit in on the chat and I've been thinking about establishing kind of awards UDL awards so I was wondering what are you gentlemen thinking on the topic uh, Kevin I know what are you thinking you know already <laughs> uh, so uh, what I was thinking about some categories and I will throw here a few really really basic examples like uh, the Ray Emery Memorial Trophy uh, memorial because uh, sadly he yeah, passed away he passed away recently but uh, based on the first season of action in the UDL my idea was to have some categories that are linked to the players to not go historical further back than the history of the league so to do to have some awards based on this first season so Ray Emery uh, interestingly enough he managed to become a Stanley Cup champion and a UDL champion in this particular season the 2013 one and in both teams he was a very underrated but valuable contributor so this could be one that we stick but the next ones are really more of a just throwing in there. Like the least Tempniak trophy to the best player with an UDL salary below 1 million, like the <coughs> late round steal or uh, cheap uh, auction pickup or whatever. Then the positional ones could be had like the Alex Ovechkin trophy, pretty straightforward. Also the Dustin Bufflin one and the Steve Ott Trophy to the best UDL physical force with at least a bit of scoring touch uh, of course you can put also here a gold tending uh, trophy like the King Henrik Trophy or something and we can go to maybe some team related uh, awards like the Bad Luck Brian Trophy or, or maybe you can call it the Benedict Trophy 
uh, with, with no offense to Mike in any way, but just what uh, he did in this uh, first year or how bad a look he had was uh, really impressive. Uh, so what do you think guys? Let, let me know and let us let us discuss. We can maybe put together something and we can hand them out in the summer where we have nothing else to do and have a video about it. So that's about it. Thanks for watching. Keep uh, keep your comments and thanks again for the support and appreciation of the videos. Uh, I have already one suggestion for a video from Brad, which I think I'll be able to put together until the end of the month. So you can pretty much expect at least one more series before we put end to August and the boring, uh, the most boring time of the year as far as hockey goes. So thanks again and bye bye.